All right, so we're looking here at distribution and concentration of materials in the environment. Um, we are going to be talking about what happens to pollutants once we get them into the environment. Up to this point, we've talked uh, in the first section about certain different chemicals that might exist in the environment, about acids, about bases. Um, in the second section, we talked a little bit more about how specific chemicals can be measured. We talked about concentration. Uh, we talked about a few other things related to how do we adjust concentrations um, of gases like oxygen and water, things like that. Here we're going to talk specifically about, okay, if something has got to the environment, what's it going to do? So let's take a look. First of all, materials can be spread. Well, there's different ways of doing that. One way is through the air. Okay, there are three stages. Ask me later about the uh, actions to go with this. It's very memorable. Um, we have release from the source. Um, we have dispersion through the atmosphere, so it's scattering. Um, and then finally it comes floating down or raining down. Um, and deposited in the soil or the water. Okay. All right, and then we can talk about sources of pollutants. Um, we don't always know right up front, but we can deduce them. If the wind normally blows from the west, and suddenly your house smells like skunk, you probably look on the west side of your house to figure out where it was. Or look away from the west side of your house so you don't have to see the skunk. Um, that type of a thing. We can deduce it from wind and precipitation evidence. Right? We can track something back due to the prevailing winds. Now, I use a skunk as, a, as an example, but that's not typically what we're looking at here. We'd typically be looking at large-scale air pollution. Okay. Um, if you look in uh, Southwest Asia, Indonesia, that area, often during the uh, certain times of the year is the burning season when large tracts of jungle are cleared and burned for agriculture. Well, that brings huge pollution um, into all the places downwind of them. Okay. Things will blow a lot further in the wind if it doesn't rain, so if there's precipitation, Precipitation usually will deposit pollutants closer to the source than wind will. Okay. Um, if you're looking at smokestacks, is what we typically call them, you can see two different types here. There's these ones that are billowing all the white stuff and then the gray stuff. White stuff very often is steam, not always, but very often is just simply steam. If you drive past the uh, Rogers Sugar Plant in Tabor, um, mostly that's steam. Same thing if you do the McCain's plant between Coldale and Tabor. Um, or there's a distillery brewery place in North Lethbridge. Same kind of thing. Mostly what's being released into the air there is steam, water vapor. Um, you see grayish stuff? Eh, maybe not quite so good. Okay, through groundwater. So first way again, backing it up here, is spreading materials can be spread through the air. Through the groundwater is the next one. Um, essentially here is water is going to soak down through the soil and it moves in a variety of directions until it reaches a level where all the gaps between particles are filled with water. We call this the water table. Okay. The water does not move very fast um, through the ground. This is going to prevent fast dispersion. Um, definition here really quickly is uh, of this word pores. Pores are spaces between particles. Um, and if the pores are interconnected, dispersion happens quickly, relatively quickly. Um, this is not like a blink of an eye kind of thing. It's going to take its time. Okay. Um, moving ahead here. If the pores are close together, they're going to actually prevent easy movement of water. Back near the beginning of this unit, we did talk about sanitary landfills. 
Often they'll use compacted clay at the base. It helps to prevent water from leaving. Okay. So groundwater, waddle, um, water. Um, if you've heard of people drilling a well to have well water, often it's drilled down below the level of the water table. Okay. Now this lovely picture, we've got this level here, even with the bottom of this lake or the swamp, is the water table during a dry period. Um, and then we've got normal water table, it's a bit higher. And then there's this process called discharge, which is bringing water from the water table directly into the swamp or lake. If you've ever gone to a beach, you can sort of see this small scale, right? If you dig a hole lower than the level of the lake or the ocean, it'll fill with water. Um, it's our reverse process of discharge. Water moves back from the lake into the hole you've dug that goes lower than it. Okay. Um, deeper wells generally are more stable in terms of you always have water. Shallow wells maybe run out sometimes. Um, this whole area down here below the level of the water table that's full of water, known as an aquifer. Um, if there's pollution, now pollution, again, let's draw my pollution in red dots. There they are. They're going to get carried down. So if somebody dumps a bunch of pollution right here by this well, really a terrible idea. It gets into this water table here. Some of it will get, indeed, brought up through the well. As dispersion continues, diffusion will happen. Eventually, da 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 da, discharge, 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 and we've got pollution in the swamp or the lake that was released way up here. Um, eventually, it's pretty diluted by this point in time. But we get it down here, and even this deep well might get polluted or contaminated. If this aquifer is connected to some larger one, the whole lot of it gets polluted or contaminated. Now, depending on what this is, this might not be a huge deal. It might be a really big deal, depending on how poisonous this uh, pollutant happens to be. All right. So some different sources you should know about. Um, minerals that are in rocks and soils actually can be contaminants of groundwater or well water. They can provide iron, calcium, or selenium. Um, if you've ever been to somebody's house and around bathroom faucets um, or sinks, there's kind of rusty colored spots um, it doesn't mean that they're just terrible people who don't clean. Um, what it means, probably, um, is that they've got iron in their water, and that iron tends to stain um, either fiberglass tubs or porcelain tubs or the paint that might be in older tubs. Um, iron tends to stain that. You get rust. Okay, you can have organic materials. Okay, both natural and man-made. They could be pesticide, they could be solvents, they could be petroleum products. Okay, we can have leachate, um, which would come water that leaches out of landfills and mines that is full of, or um, full of dissolved stuff. Um, it might be things like lead, mercury, cadmium, which are all heavy metals. It could be decomposition products if it's coming from a landfill. Um, it could be a variety of other things. These are just a few here to look at. Okay. Um, underground pipeline and tank leaks could be things like gasoline, natural gas, or oil. Um, old gas station where they used to have the tanks for the gas underground. Definitely problematic. That soil typically is saturated with a lot of gasoline because typically those tanks um, would leak. Not a lot, but a little bit. Okay, we can have inorganic stuff. Again, um, organic, again, this means it's containing carbon. Inorganic is no carbon. So this could be things used for de-icing roads. So if you salt a road, um, that salt's got to go somewhere when the snow melts in the spring. Goes into the ditch, that's a pollutant of some sort. <laughs> Agriculture is another source of contamination. It could be things like fertilizer. Industry is another one, exhaust. Um, all of these things can get into the environment um, and 
we end up with problems. Okay, we can have microorganisms as another point of problems. Um, and these can come from septic tanks, from sewage treatment, from waste storage. Okay, now this type of a, you know, it's not killing all living things, but it's going to be bad for, well, us. Um, we could talk about household chemicals. Um, these would include nitrates, phosphorus compounds, detergents, chlorine compounds, and so on. Um, you can look at a bigger list, page 239 in your textbook if you want. Or on the textbook pages that I will have scanned. Oh, there we go. Okay, so first way again through the air, second way through groundwater, third way through surface water. Okay, so this would be things like streams, rivers, lakes. Okay, and so pollutants or contaminants may enter from precipitation. So we get acid rain. Write that one down next to that if you wanted to draw a little arrow coming into that. Right, we could have acid rain from groundwater, from runoff, and outflow. Um, all of these things can lead to... Excuse me. All of these things can lead to the pollution of surface water. Generally, if whatever there is is low concentration, there's not a big problem. Um, generally, also, the dispersion is quick. And this means concentrations are low and they stay th low throughout. That said, low dispersion could cause problems. So, a little drop of something poisonous or somewhat polluting drops into a large river it's low concentration to begin with and then it gets dispersed we're not going to notice a big problem right quickly on the other hand you drop that little bit of poisonous stuff into a pond it's not going anywhere and so low dispersion could cause problems um, most large communities get drinking water from surface water, and so that treatment of it is important, as is controlling pollution. So they got to make sure that the water they're giving to their people is clean. Also need to make sure that there's no um, major sources of pollution getting in. That helps to actually make cleaning the water cheaper. Okay. Another way is through the soil. Now this sounds a lot like through the groundwater. Here we're talking specifically about the process of these contaminants moving through the soil. So if water lands on the soil, it can really do four things. It can evaporate, it can soak into the soil and be used by plants, it can run onto the street or onto surface water, or into surface water, sorry, or it can soak through the soil and move downward and dissolve substances in the soil, making a mixture known as leachate. Okay. Now, the soil itself may slow the leachate down, so things like clay. They can chemically change it. It would be like limestone is capable of neutralizing acids. Um, it may react with it in some other way as well. Um, the soil can also absorb certain chemicals. Okay. Now, hydrocarbons. So this would be things like um, oil spills. So if you've got crude oil that spills, or gasoline, or any other kind of oil. Now, normally they're not water-soluble, and they don't spread. But what they will do is create toxic local conditions. Now, they also tend to coat soil and fill the pores of the soil, and it makes it very hard for that to be cleaned up. So... Those are the ways that we're going to talk about those four of stuff, contaminants, whether it be pollutants or otherwise, um, how they can spread so we've got through the air. <coughs> excuse me, sorry. Through groundwater, through surface water, and through the soil. Okay, we can talk about changing concentrations. So how do we change, you know, if there's pollution in some sort, how do we change it? Well, we can disperse it. We can have dispersion, where the chemicals are scattered away from the source. We can have dilution. Um, often these two kind of go hand in hand. Right? These two happen at about the same time. 
Um, we can so dispersion they scatter away from the source and as that happens they're getting mixed with lots more air or water and surprise surprise um, they get diluted okay now moving water so if we pour this into a stream or it lands in a stream it will increase the speed of both dispersion and dilution but depending on how toxic the thing is, it might not be enough. Think about LD50. If the LD50 is really low, um, it might not be enough to make it so that it's not hazardous. Okay. Concentrations can also change not only because of dispersion and dilution, but biodegradation. Biodegrading. Um, big word here, biodegradation which is where microorganisms are used to get rid of a variety of substances, possibly getting rid of pollutants. Okay. Now, usually, biodegradable substances are made of organic materials, although not all organic materials are biodegradable. Okay. Plastic is an organic material. It has carbon in it, but it does not biodegrade. An apple, I've used this excuse when I was growing up, saying it's okay to throw an apple out the window of a vehicle. Like, not at other vehicles, but into the ditch. Um, it's never okay to throw an apple out of a moving vehicle at a moving, a different moving vehicle or you know, a person just as an aside there. Um, but, you know, throw it into the ditch or something, and we say, well, it's biodegradable, it's okay, because it'll rot down to nothingness and just help the soil. In fact, I'm helping, you know, I make, make all kinds of goofy excuses. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure if I totally agree with them anymore, but... Uh, Generally, yes, if you have something that's biodegradable, it's not going to cause a big issue. Because, again, something made out of, like, a food stuff, it will form soil, essentially, again. Um, bacteria. Now, a couple definitions you have to know here. Bacteria can be aerobic, which means they require oxygen, or they can be anaerobic, which means they require no oxygen. Now, there's actually some anaerobic bacteria that can be used to make PCBs less dangerous <coughs> by removing chlorine. Now, poly PCB is a polychlorinated biphenyl, or sometimes known as a bisphenyl. Um, what I'd like you to do right now is oops, sorry, quickly pause this, go on to Wikipedia, tell me and write down in your notes, what is a PCB? it yeah right now go ahead okay we'll be checking on this later on continue it uh, cold weather like winter slows biodegradation obviously you throw an apple out the back door of your house every day all winter well not maybe this winter um, normally we I use the illustration that you could have them disappear disappear into a snow drift um, come spring, the snowdrift melts, and oh, there's a bunch of apple cores that really aren't changed a whole lot because they've been frozen. Um, if you let them sit there all summer, they'll attract a lot of wasps and bees and bugs, and pretty quickly they will degrade into a rotten pile of apples and then eventually into some sort of composty like thing. Probably not a great idea to have that on your lawn, but um, I think you get the point. Um, the pH, so how acidic. It is what nutrients are available, how much moisture, how much oxygen, what the temperature is, all affect the rate of biodegradation. Um, essentially, the closer pH, close to neutral, enough nutrients to feed whatever's trying to biodegrade it, a reasonable amount of moisture, good levels of oxygen, temperature, I mean, warmish, up to about our temp, like our body temperature, so like 20 to 37 degrees. 20 to 40 degrees Celsius are good. You get too much hotter, too much colder, and it slows down. Okay. Um, and there you can see some, some grass that's still growing, some leaves that are in the process of biodegrading. Um, and then at the bottom of this whole little mixture, um, you know, we've got these grayish looking things, bits of leaves and things like that, um, that are in the process of further being biodegraded. Um, another word here um, of changing concentrations is known as phytoremediation. Big word, okay? 
Um, remediation, if we look at this middle part here, remed, looks like remedy. But remedy is like a cure. Now, phyto um, has to, it's a prefix meaning with plants. Um, and remediation comes from remedy, which I already said is the cure. The phyto part has to do with plants. So we're using plants to cure something or to fix something. <coughs> and yes, we're using plants to reduce soil or groundwater concentration of pollutants. In this case, plants absorb chemicals from the soil as they grow. The plants are harvested and then disposed of. And guess what? The soil is much cleaner. Important here is that the plants have to be harvested or taken away and disposed of. Can't let them sit there and rot, decompose, releasing all those chemicals back into the soil. Sorry. All right. Pollutants. Um, pollutant metals in this way actually can sometimes be not only removed from the soil, but they can also be recovered from the plants. Okay. So there's some plants that are maybe phytoremediating, but it's a pretty picture anyways. Okay. Photolysis is another way of changing these concentrations. Okay. Anytime in science where you see this lice or lysis kind of word, it means something is being split. Okay, so in its case of photolysis, it's light using being used to split. Here we're using light to break chemicals into simpler forms. Um, an example of this would be ozone formation. Okay. It's a two-step process, and the first step is photolysis, where we have nitrogen dioxide plus light gives us nitrogen monoxide plus an oxygen. We call this a free radical. That's beyond what you need to worry about for science 9. But that free radical will combine with O2 to make O3. That first step is photolysis. Now, that's um, another way, one thing to think about, but here we've got another method here. Um, if you've seen photodegradable plastics or styrofoams are other examples. Things that if they're left in the sun, they will break down. Normally these things would take hundreds or thousands of years to degrade. Okay, now obviously if it's photodegradable, it doesn't work if the plastic is buried. So if your plastic ends up inside a garbage bag or inside a landfill, photodegradable stuff just doesn't do its job. Okay. Now, what happens to living things? We talked about the kind of the, the physical environment. What about the living part of the environment? Well, one thing that you've probably talked about in the past is biomagnification. Okay. This is an increase in concentration as a pollutant or chemical moves up the food chain. You know, so you can think about mercury being absorbed by algae, Invertebrates eat lots of algae, fish eat lots of invertebrates, and birds eat lots of fish. I got louder, and it's showing, trying to, and the font got bigger. Um, it's trying to show that the concentration of mercury, you know, inside each algae, pretty little. But the invertebrates each eat a lot of algae, and so inside the invertebrates, there's a little bit more. The fish eats a lot of those, and so there's quite a bit more in the fish. And then the birds eat lots of the fish, and so there's quite a bit more inside the birds. Um, and so even though the concentration in the water, in the algae, is pretty low, by the time we get to the birds, it's quite high. Um, the amount and concentration of mercury in this case increases with each step up the food chain. Um, another example you might have heard of is DDT, which is an insecticide. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that one later on. Okay, what about oil? Well, if you were here last week Thursday, you watched a video about oil. Um, now, when we talk about oil, we have to talk a little bit about both short-term and long-term effects. So if an oil spills or pollutes, there's short-term things and then there's long-term things. There's immediately act acting things. So certain things have, just generally, not specifically to oil, short-term or immediate effects. Fertilizers, herbicides, right? Fertilizers help stuff to grow pretty much right away. Herbicides start to kill plants pretty much right away. Okay. There's also long-term effects. These are things that affect the future. 
Um, again, not specific to oil, but things like biomagnification, which we just talked about, is a long-term effect. Okay. Now, oil spills from ships, pipelines, trucks, trains, or otherwise have both long and short-term effects. Crude oil itself, it's how oil comes out of the ground. It doesn't mean oil that tells nasty jokes. Um, it contains many chemicals, including lead and mercury. Both of those are heavy metals. Some chemicals may also contain sulfur, nitrogen, oxygen. Okay. Uh, moving ahead. All types of crude oil must be processed prior to use. So what you pour into your engine of your car is never crude oil. It's definitely processed. It's highly processed before it makes its way so that your consumers can use it. Um, however, if it spills... Um, you can see the picture here of a beach. Probably not the kind of beach you want to go play at right now. Right? All this black stuff here, that's oil. Coating <laughs> the garbage, um, but also coating the sand. Coating anything that might be trying to live in the sand. Or in the top part of the water. Not a good place to be if you're living things. Okay, I'm going to get you to make some notes on oil spills using two, pages 250, 251 in the text. Okay, um, You're going to focus on these points. It's talking about the Exxon Valdez oil spill. We'll talk a little bit later about uh, the BP one in the Gulf of Mexico. But this one here is another one that you may have heard of. So take a look at that. It's in the notebook that you have. You can see here a boom between these two ships that would be used to try to contain um, an oil slick floating on the water because oil, most of it is less dense than water, so it floats. Um, and the video talked a little bit about different technologies for that. <clears throat> How to clean up after an oil spill, especially in the water. Well, skimming systems containment booms are used to capture oil floating on the water and prevent it from dispersing. Sometimes they'll try to pump it back into a ship and then carry it away to be processed. Sometimes they'll contain it, and I've seen it where they've tried to just burn it off, prevent it from spreading. They'll pollute the air a little bit, but that'll spread quickly. Um, it's better than the water, they figure. Okay, what about the beach? Well, we can remove the sediment and then replace it with clean sand. Sometimes you can recover oil from it. Oftentimes you can't. Um, you can wash animals or birds that have been coated in oil. Um, this is one of the physical uh, hands-on tasks that need to be done in the aftermath of an oil spill or often need to be done. Um, in Alberta, if you have a spill greater than two cubic meters, it must be reported. So this is not, you know, oh no, I spilled a drop of oil on the ground when I was changing oil. You want to try not to do that, but it's not two cubic meters. Two cubic meters would be 2,000 liters. Okay. Finally, we've got a little section here that doesn't really fit anywhere else in the curriculum, and so they've thrown it here. Um, hazards in the house. <clears throat> right? All of these things can be dangerous. Person, um, household cleaners, personal hygiene products, pet care products, paint and paint products, pesticides and fertilizers, and automotive fluids. Okay. Lovely picture there. Um, the gist of it is all of these things, yeah, we use them, they're useful to us, but we have to be careful with them. Uh, so the government has come up with a bunch of regulations. We've talked about WIMIS already. Um, we've looked at MSDS, which are material safety data sheets, to get LD50 information. Um, and so there's requirements for labeling um, that you have to say what the thing is meant to be used for. Um, you have to look at the physical and chemical properties, the active ingredients, the instructions for use, safety precautions, the health effects, environmental effects, the toxicity and first aid. There's other stuff on there as well, usually firefighting information. You know, if you should use water, that's probably good to know. Um, there's a list on page 255 talking about labels for storage. Basically, it's use common sense. Don't put chemicals.
bottles in reach of small children. If the bottle is leaking, perhaps make sure that it's in something that can't leak. Um, don't store gasoline or other flammable things next to flames. <gasps> Surprise, I know. Um, it's basically a lot of common sense kind of stuff. Often you'll actually see a PAT question dealing with these kinds of things. Oops, so no. Okay. Um, if you're transporting dangerous goods or chemicals of any sort, um, you know, transportation kind of takes place on both ends of it. Before you use it and after you use it. Common sense. Beware of fumes and spills should be the followed. You know, keep them away from children and pets and so on. Um, disposal, generally, we don't pour down the drain unless you've been told that it's safe. Um, don't pour it into the soil. Okay, there's <clears throat> different places that are hazardous waste collection sites, and they'll take things like electronics, paint, fertilizer, and pesticides, um, and they allow safe disposal of otherwise harmful pollutants. That takes us to the end of the notes for this section.